What's up, everybody? Welcome to Best Granites. My name is Marcin, and I'll be your host for tonight's podcast segment, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is a little bit of a project that I came up with along with my affiliates at SKN, ZUS, SKH, uh, especially Piotr and Kuba. Shout out to you guys. Appreciate the help you guys are giving me. Um, today, I want to touch up on a couple subjects with my buddy, long t- long time colleague Justin Parra, uh, specifically in terms of player development and the route that he took from the very beginnings of his volleyball career up until his collegiate training. So with that, Justin, I'm going to hand you the mic and let you introduce yourself. Um, my name's Justin. Uh, I uh, currently reside in Chicago, Illinois, and uh I am a volleyball coach at a travel volleyball club called Michio, as well as a college assistant coach at Illinois Institute of Technology. Also want to let people know in Poland that club refers to the youth level. Uh, Justin deals with a rather advanced level of athlete. Um, He has been my long-term teammate. He's been a colleague. He's been a mentor to me. Um, But just like me, he's had a journey in volleyball, and I kind of want to get into it because he has gone through the collegiate route, specifically with training, scholarships, and the whole nine yards that a professional collegiate athlete goes through within their playing career. So... Justin, could you tell me a little bit about how your collegiate route looked, how you got there? Um, are you talking from like youth to getting recruited? Um, or are you talking about my like first beginnings of being a college athlete? Just give us a quick snapshot of when you began volleyball, when you decided that you wanted to go into the collegiate route and how you got to playing at the collegiate level. Okay. Um, I kind of grew up around the sport. Uh, my family was pretty involved in it uh, socially. Uh, so I kind of knew of it pretty well. My cousin had dabbled in it a little bit um, when she was younger. She's about 10 years older than me. Um, and then I would say around... 12 or 13, um, I kind of started, you know, thinking about taking it a little more serious. I had been playing uh, competitive baseball for a very long time, so I wanted to see what, like, a competitive version of volleyball was like. So I found uh, a local club that was uh, practicing uh, within, like, 20 minutes in a gym about 20 minutes away from where I was living. Uh, tried out for th- their team. Um, I ended up making a 15U team. So I was um, pretty young playing up. But that was the only team they had that was that young. And then for a couple of years, I stayed there, played 15U <laughs> for a couple of years in a row. Uh, and then through high school, uh, Continued playing uh, multiple different kind of position changes here and there uh, as I'm not very uh, advanced in the height department. (laughs) I'm about uh, 5'10", so um, being a hitter was pretty difficult or getting difficult as as I approached um, that 18-year-old mark, I would say. so my senior year of high school, my, in my last year playing club, I ended up actually setting, which was the first time I'd, I'd ever done that. Uh, that was a very difficult change. Um, uh, and it was hard, like, mentally to accept that this was a new position that I wanted, that I was into, and uh, physically, because I had never played it before. So I was training a whole new thing. Um, and... You know, I wanted to play college volleyball, so I felt like I was at a disadvantage because I was so far behind others. Um, But fortunately, 
um, the hard work kind of paid off and um, I had a coach see like my potential. So I was offered a college scholarship um, uh, towards like the end of my uh, club's year, towards the beginning of the spring. Um, and uh, it was for Robert Morris University, which is an NAIA program. And um, there was a player on that team that had gone to our high school uh, the year, a year before. So he kind of put this coach on notice that I was someone a little bit more off the radar that was, uh, that was a hard worker, very determined. So um, they had came out and seen a couple of my matches and decided to pursue me going to their school. And so it kind of worked out. Gotcha. And also for our Polish viewers, want to give you guys a quick understanding of some of the things Justin mentioned. He said he's five foot ten, which is the height of 177 centimeters. Uh, just wanted to get that clear throughout the conversation. And then he's talking about Robert Morris University that he attended, which was an NAIA school, meaning that it was, I think, two divisions below the first league, the league that you think of when you think of UCLA, Stanford, Loyola, those types of schools, basically. Mm. So, Justin, question you because, you know, right now, I'm playing, you could say, collegiately in Poland while studying for my master's. Can't necessarily compare that to the stature of collegiate volleyball back in the U.S. as Poland focuses more on their club development and is more professional in the route of, you know, bringing their top talent to those clubs instead of taking them and playing at a university in a university league. So I wanted to kind of see what your training's like, what kind of resources you used, and just want to facilitate that conversation so our uh, listeners, not viewers, um, have an idea of how an American athlete is treated. So to start off with a little bit of training background, can you describe a typical week of training in your collegiate volleyball program? Yeah, um, and I have experiences being in two different programs. I guess I should have mentioned that um, in my breakdown. So after my freshman year, um, at Robert Morris, I decided to transfer to another school, uh, which was also within the NAI um, for academic reasons. Um, but they also had a men's volleyball team. So I was able to transfer over and um, maintain on an, uh, an, on an athletic scholarship. Uh, so my experience is kind of being in two different programs, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, I would say typically, um, you know, your first semester uh, of, of, of a new year uh, is the off season for men's volleyball. So uh, the season starts. In when does the semester year. start in America? Because it's a little bit different out in Poland. Oh, that's true. Um, I would say around like August, like mid August, early September is um, typically when you're. Uh, starting your semester depending on if you're on or you could be on a quarter system which is a whole different thing but that's a whole nother explanation nonetheless, nonetheless. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're usually starting around you know august september mark um so you're in the you're kind of approaching the fall territory um so yeah during that time it, it would be considered off season so contact days um which is uh, their rulings essentially by the governing organization being the NAIA or NCAA. They allowed the coach and the program certain amount of parameters with um, times you can meet as a team and uh, meet with your coach. So for us in the off season, um, we would do team lifts. Um, about two to three times per week. Um, and we would have to be together during that time, uh, as well as like individual lift programs on some of the other off days. 
uh, that you were held accountable for getting done on your own time, which, you know, it's, is, what, well, could you explain what an off day is as well, really quick? Um, yeah, like an off day would just be, there's, um, uh, uh, no, no, like you're, you're yeah, you're, there's no training at all. So you are just, you're left a, a day to yourself as an athlete or as a student. Um, to kind of, if you have classes, you can get your classwork done, whatever it is, um, you know, social life, things like that, um, you can get done. So you're, so you're not required, um, to be doing any team activities on that given day. So we consider those off days. But you just mentioned that you guys had, uh, a set of drills given you a set of lips, correct? Yeah, so there was a lifting program set up by our um, athletic training team at our school. Um, so it would be a lot of different power lifts um, to work on, you know, being a little more explosive um, and um, a little more like lower body core strength wise uh, lifts to just um, build up our muscles and our bodies to be prepared for the impact of, um, of, a, of a volleyball season where, you know, you have to be, you're jumping consistently. Um, you're banging your body on the ground here and there. So you just got to be able to manage that. Gotcha. So you guys started from square one and I forgot to start from square one here because um, you're talking about, you know, being at your team lifts two to three times a week during the off season, you know, for somebody in Poland, for example, me living in Warsaw and being um, on the team at SKH, I sometimes have to take 30 to 40 minutes to get to practice if I can get to practice. Um, were you guys commuting far or how did, you know, attending your university look like for you? Were you on campus? Could you yeah. talk about that? Um, yeah, I made the decision to live on campus, um, which most athletes did, um, unless they happen to live within 20 or so minutes of the school. Um, there were a couple guys on our team that just stayed at home to save some money. But as an athlete, like, um, it's very difficult, you know, because uh, you don't 100% know what your schedule is going to be from week to week, you know, um, or month to month, because things are constantly changing with um, all the other athletics that are on campus, you know, fighting for gym time, uh, fighting for weight room time or trainer time, you know, you kind of, you want to be close to home. So that way you can always have sleep, get study done, whatever the case may be. Absolutely. So it sounds like volleyball more over was your life during yeah. that time. Uh -huh. It was definitely a responsibility to take care of because in um, America, I don't know if it's, you know, if there are same opportunities in Poland like this, but um, the volleyball team is able to pay a portion of your tuition um, for school. So oh my, I remember that in Poland, majority of schools don't, you know, you don't have to pay for school in Poland. Yeah. So that's okay. So that's, that's something that's very different. I guess that explains Much why we act the way we do then. Um, Cause school is not, very expensive in America. Justin, I'm not hundred percent sure if I'm completely right with this, but you know, you go, there's sports academies here that focus very heavily on, training and like bring it into school okay. not how it works here but the world is a little bit different i just want our listeners to know a little bit more about you specifically yeah. so think about europe just you know let them know how your um career how your day-to-day -day looked yeah. like what college was like for you yeah so um yeah uh on like a typical on a typical day, let's say now we're in season. Um, uh, we're we pr we're practicing five days a week, um, and we'll have Saturday Sunday off. Um, 
unless we happen to have a match or a tournament on that on a Saturday or Sunday. So that would be a travel day where yeah. we'd be there. So if we didn't have any obligation to matches on the weekend, we would be off um, for just rest and recovery. Gotcha. Out of, out of curiosity, Justin, um, with that training, did it look the same every week where you guys had a set? Yeah, that's they, where. Um, or did, they, did your coach change it up so you guys worked on um, overall player development or team development? Yeah, so that's what I'm getting into is, um, you know, with everyone's class scheduling, it's very difficult to find, uh, a, you know, a two to three hour slot. But yeah, typically a three hour slot um, that everyone's free at the same time to get in the gym and practice. Um, so what we ended up having to do were do uh, uh, like five, 5 a.m. practices. 5, 5.30, um, uh, we would start around 5 or 5.30. I, I can't, I can't remember. I think it was, I think it was something like we would get into the gym at five o'clock and then by the time everyone, you know, got dressed, got any uh, yeah. training yeah. stuff, the, we would practice about 5.30. Yeah. Um, in, in those the what were those practices focused on? Were they focused on individual skill? Were they focused on yeah. skill? So Very? throughout the week, it kind of it kind of um, was a determinant on if we had uh, you know when our next matches were. So typically we played Tuesday Thursdays. So um, Monday's practice would be. Um, a little bit geared towards um, some situational things. We would have two court, a two court setup, so it'd be two nets up, um, and we would split the team up, um, you know, by positions. Would kind of be grouped together, and we would work on some situational things, whether it be like the the passers, um, um, working on serve receive stuff. Uh, working on some defense stuff or blocking even um, on another court and setters could be working on some footwork and um, some location stuff you know those those things would kind of be done for the first half of practice so maybe an hour to hour and a half with, with footwork location and whatnot was this you know just a regular plan that was schemed up year to year by your coach or was it individually tailored based um, on of your play i guess it kind of it, it kind of varied i mean it was it was always pretty standard um in terms of like uh uh it wasn't necessarily like a, Hey, you know, this is something that I needed to work on. So let me do this. Cause there, there was, there was two or three other guys uh, or there was always one or two other guys um, that were setting with me. So it couldn't really be super specified like that. If I wanted individual training, I can go in later in the afternoon to do um, some one-on-ones if I, if I felt like I needed that. But during that time slot, it was more so working on um, the uniformity of all of us. So um, You're, you mentioned so, one on ones. How were you able to have these one on ones? Um, well, yeah, like so uh, we would have practice at five. Time don't five, 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 eight, eight, eight. Was there coaches? Was there coaches readily available at every moment of the day for a one-on-one? -on -one it kind of, it kind of, it, 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 it fluctuated. So, like I said, like a, you could potentially get some reps in the in the afternoon, um, but so you would get done with practice at eight o'clock. You'd, you'd go and get your classwork and stuff done. So maybe by two, three o'clock you can go back over to the gym. Um, and I would, uh, you know, our coach was pretty good about being in the, in his office um, regularly. So like daily. Um, so you can go up there and you could chat with him and say, Hey, I want to work on a couple things here or there. And 
um, you know, he would come down and, and be willing to work with work with uh, one of us on whatever we 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 kind of were were looking for for maybe like you know a half hour, forty five minutes. Um, That's nice. You know, my coach was not even present in our game yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> oh baby. Yeah, so you can you can get you can get some work in like that. But there were times. Shout out to my volleyball team really quick. I think we're right now at 21 and zero when it comes to sets one over the season. So look at that. You don't even need your coach there. <laughs> just wanted to put them out there. <laughs> no, we don't. But it sounds like, you know, because we're getting a little deep into it. Um, your experience was very almost individually tailored and you were almost, you know, not bred, but you were um surrounded by volleyball because you were on campus you had a ton of resources available to you whether it was for training purposes or potentially academic purposes if i'm not wrong yeah um does any aspect of your training stand out the most when it comes to being the most valuable for your player development um i just think for me it was just the the being able to be in the gym and get touches um you know as i said i i transitioned into being a setter um only a year before um playing college volleyball so i had really only been setting for one season um prior to so you know being able to be in a gym constantly work on you know my technique my form um working on my volleyball iq from that position was crucial so for me mostly as 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 an individual player um you know i i take i i take a lot of ownership of that on my own and i'm able to stay very motivated to get those things done whether a coach is in the gym or not uh so for me yeah like as as, so, as long as i can get into a gym and um, if someone was tossing for me, passing for me, um, or if I had a hitter there or not, it didn't matter. Um, I just found a way to get a little bit better um, each day. Uh, so I would just say that, yeah, just being able to get in and have gym time available to me was 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 big. That's nice. Um, that's definitely something I wish I had throughout my career for those listening, my career was a little bit different than Justin's. I decided to go into a bigger school for academic purposes and for social purposes. <laughs> uh, but we had a very good volleyball program that was run as a student organization, and it was a part of the D1 club volleyball scene. I think it's NCVF, if I still remember correctly, name of the organization or the league. Um, we played really well. We were typically ranked in the top five throughout my years playing there. Had a fantastic time, but I never got to experience the full on student athlete route, just like Justin. So I'm trying to compare it to mine, not only in America, but mainly right now in Poland, because as I mentioned, I'm playing for Eskeha's team. We're currently in Druga Liga, which, you know, has talent, I guess. Um, but I see drastic differences between uh, my training program compared to the training program that I even had in the States. And I just wanted to see how, you know, other people hearing about the way that athletes are treated in college in America resonates with you. So focusing a little bit more on that player development um i think volleyball is one of the most mental games out there outside of i'd say golf to be honest where you have to rely on your instincts you have to rely on uh being prepared before a ball comes at you and you have to be constantly mentally mentally engaged and positive in order to produce net positive results uh so i think the mental game is extremely important um Transitioning from the high school game, which is gosh, gymnasium phase, I guess you could say in, in Poland. 
were you mentally prepared for competition at the collegiate level? Um, yeah, yeah, I would say so. I'm, I'm a very competitive person. So for me, um, it's always fun to compete against, uh, excuse me. It's always fun to compete against the best. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if, if I see a, a skill gap in those moments, it just motivates me to work a little bit harder. So for me, like the mental side of things, um, yeah, I was very prepared going into it. It was a, it was a, a lot of hours in the gym, a lot of work, a lot of work in the weight room. Um, and like anyone, you, you play your first match, you're going to have those nerves. Um, but after then, you know, it was just normal. You know, you just, you just keep grinding, keep going. Well, out of curiosity, outside of you, your own character, um, what helped you develop that mental edge when it came to volleyball? I'm curious if a person did so, if you did it yourself, if family did, what gave you your edge? Uh, I don't know. That's, that's, that's a good question. Um, I just think maybe it's been environment from who I'm around in the gym a lot of times. And just, um, I've been very fortunate to be a part of some really tight knit groups um, throughout my entire playing career. So having everyone kind of around you and support you and you, you wanting to see um, and support your other teammates and success, it's, it's kind of easy to feel motivated, easy to feel that competitive, um, competitiveness um, and wanting to get better. And I think, you know, specifically my gym in my freshman year, um, our coach had a very big impact on creating that dynamic and creating that environment um, with, you know, competitive drills, um, in everything, whether it was a ball control drill, whether it was a scrimmage drill, whether it was a whatever drill, there was always some sort of element of a winning side, losing side, or a winner, a loser, um, you know, in healthy ways to compete against everyone and to, um, to kind of turn that competitive edge on for when it came game time. And I gotcha. would say... Gotcha. So are you, are you saying you got that competitive edge from constantly being engaged in a competitive mindset at practice. And then you also ended up mentioning something about your teammates keeping you mentally engaged because you guys were a tight knit group. I was wondering if you could speak more on um, what you mean by a tight knit group. Were you guys close as teammates or were you guys also close off the court? Yeah, I think we were, we were just, we were close as, just people, you know, we were, uh, you know, I had close friends on uh, teams that I've been on and um, specifically like in my college, in my college years, um, we would find ways to um, always hang out as a team um, pretty consistently, you know, so whether it was getting, you know, a team dinner or lunch before or after a match um, or a team oh. breakfast after our 5 a.m. practices. <laughs> um, you know, I, I had lived on campus, and as I had mentioned before, there were, you know, a couple players who lived, um, who were commuting because they lived, you know, 20 to 30 minutes away to try to save some money. Like some of those guys would just crash um, at our room uh, on a couch you know, before 5 a.m. practice. So they just could get an extra 30 minutes of sleep in if they wanted to. <laughs> um, That's we just, I mean, we, we constantly found ways to be around each other to create some good bonds and connections. I'm assuming you guys didn't get too much sleep if they came over because, you know, you power up the PS, you power up the Xbox. Not, and yeah, get, yeah. Some, some of the gaming sessions were, were had, for sure. Um. But with you talking about, you know, creating that bond off the court, how much do you think it translated to what happened on the court, your success on the court? I mean, yeah, it was, I think it was crucial. I mean, having, if you think about anything in life, um, 
you know, your friends that you have around you, you trust, you know, unequivocally, you know, and if you're in a work environment, um, imagine having one of your, one of your good friends be in the same office as you or working in the same, um, working in the same job with you, you know, you can trust them to get, to get something done around you and um, you don't have to worry about it at all. So now, you know, take that into the world of athletics where you have this sort of bond and um, camaraderie amongst each other when you're going into com competition with another. Um, it makes that so much easier because you know that person who you're on the court with. Um, and so it makes it easier to um, just kind of trust them in, in doing their role and competing and you have a line of communication um, that's established offside, out, outside of the court. So um, talking with one another throughout a match becomes easy um, and, you know, makes it easier to compete, makes it easier to win. A hundred percent. I agree with you there, Justin, because, you know, I've had two experience, well, multiple experiences as I've been, I've had the opportunity of competing with a decent amount of teams. But my most recent team at the University of Illinois before coming out to Poland um, was similar to yours as in we created those side bonds, whether it was through a social gathering or some kind of organized event or a celebration of the season or just simply wanting to hang, wanting to hang out after class. Uh, we had that opportunity because we were so close to each other. I mean, you mentioned you're living on campus. Campus for you is tiny i don't know it's it's yeah nothing too crazy you know i went to a college town of fifty thousand people but we were still in a couple mile couple kilometer radius it was not hard to get across town i could walk across all i needed within 30 minutes so we had that opportunity to be around each other but i've noticed throughout my time in poland that um i haven't you know for the first half of the season or three-fourths you could say now i haven't been able to establish that outside bond with my teammates unfortunately and i've you know in the beginning been curious as to why i was like is it because i'm you know a foreigner is it because there's a language barrier even though i know how to speak polish rather fluently um but i've started to notice that polish students have to focus more on also establishing the life. Like I've noticed a lot of my teammates have jobs that they also got to deal with. They're also sometimes far away from campus um, or they got other obligations, responsibilities, or other teams that they're playing for. Cause you know, here the academic league is not as important. I'm able to play on two different teams at once. Would you be able to play on two different teams at Robert Morris or San Xavier <laughs> throughout your coll uh, collegiate career, Justin, out of curiosity? Uh, no, no. What, what would your coach say to you? Uh, I'm, I don't think that's even legal, if I'm being honest. I think, uh, yeah, it would ruin your uh, status as a, uh, uh, of being eligible to play uh, as uh, for my school team. Here, it's kind of like you're getting more touches, man. Do you? Yeah, that's where I, um, I think I mentioned a little bit earlier where, um, you know, the, uh, the, the volleyball team is able to, is, is paying you in scholarship, essentially. So they're paying a portion of your tuition. So um, there's a contract that you sign each year um, that has the dollar amount of what they're paying towards your tuition as well as um uh many other things in there that you are held accountable to and um the rules and the obligations that you um need to uphold for that contract to still be um, valid so being on uh, another team or with an or another organization would be against those rules. Gotcha. And then again, uh, it's a lot different in Poland as 
they don't have to pay for university typically unless they're going private. Um, but typically a team for a college has between, I think it's eight to 12 scholarships that they're able to give out, whether they're partial or whole, full scholarships. Um, so those obviously play or in, play into a player's motivation. I was wondering how much they like that scholarship motivated you, Justin. Yeah. So for clarification too, actually for men's volleyball, yeah, NCAA is only four full scholarships they're able to give out. Wow. Yeah. So for NCAA Division One, it's four full scholarships, um, and each coach uh, is able to divide up that that money however he sees fit so most of the time um there's not a single guy on there that's on a full athletic scholarship so um playing men's volleyball is pretty difficult because you need to uphold great grades not only to stay eligible but to um qualify for uh academic scholarship money to make up the difference um from what the athletic department's able to give you or the volleyball team is able to give you for us and the NAIA um it varies school to school so each school ha um it's up to their athletic department on how they want to uh divide up the money so for St. Xavier um which is where I end up playing for three years um their scholarship was uh a pool of money when i went there so it was a certain dollar i i don't even know the, the what the cap was but there was a certain dollar amount that he um our coach was able to um pull from so he can he can send you know five thousand just to one way ten thousand to another six thousand to another you know and it kind of divvied up like that um, and I would say a bulk of our team, um, maybe only like two to three guys, uh, were receiving zero dollars. Most, yeah. most of us were at least getting a minimum of about 5,000. And if you mind giving uh, the listeners an idea of how much your tuition was yearly, do you mind spitting that out without any other scholarships? Yeah, so with uh tuition and uh living on campus with a dorm uh i believe it was somewhere around uh 40 to fifty thousand dollars and that's i'm assuming limited meals at, uh like a limited meal plan uh that's no books included right yeah, college in America is still expensive, y'all. And just to give our listeners a better idea of how volleyball looks in the U.S., it is the most popular women's sport, um, and it's still rapidly growing. Um, it's also growing in the male category. But right now, women have nearly eight times as many players participating in high school volleyball compared to males. Um, I think... There's a statistic from like 2019. I bet it's changed a decent amount. It's gone up, but we had 50,000 participants participating in male high school volleyball versus 420,000 female participants. So it's a pretty wide margin right there. Yes, that's for sure. Um, well, with scholarships obviously if they're able to invest into into their athlete i was wondering how they invested into their athletes i mean living into their facilities and resources can you talk about the facilities that were available to you as an athlete that wouldn't be available to the general population the students um, I mean, I went, I went to a small school, so, um, the population was mostly built up of athletes, I'll say, who lived on campus. Um, uh, so for us, I mean, our housing, uh, was, uh, standard amongst everyone. So there were, there were no preferential, um, rooms or housing 
that we got that um, uh, a non-athlete would have had. Um, as same as same for the meal plan and the and the food uh, on a daily day on a day to day basis. Um, we had access to a athlete only training facility for a weight room. So that would be the one of the one of the few things that we had uh, access to that no one else had. Did the uh, as well as the training room. Did the um, what, training room have equipment and um, you know offerings that a typical student would, wouldn't be able to receive? Yeah, I mean it was it was it was a standard weight room. Um, there was a couple there was a couple extra platforms for uh, or platforms and bumper plates for specific um, like power lifts and, and such like that um, but it was it was pretty it was just meant to be a place for just the athletes so you can do uh, a team lift all together um, and just not bother um, you know I guess you could say like, a, a, you know, a normal day to day person just trying to go to the gym uh, and get, you know, some workout in with with dumbbells or whatever, whatever you may they may be doing. Gotcha. Um, what, what about the training room? Could you explain what a training room is? Yeah, or or physio. I think I've heard uh, it called a little bit uh, overseas. <laughs> uh, so that would just be where you would get some treatment done um, from an athletic trainer. Uh, which would be, you know, if you were taping your ankles, um, needing to get, get, you know, stretched out um, or get any rehab recovery, injury. There was a room that you would go for that. Um, there was uh, a cold tub and uh, a heated tub that they would have in there that you could use as well, along with like, ice ice machine that you can grab your ice to you know for after practices for your shoulder or knees or ankles um, but there's just you know a lot of a lot of things that you had in there that the that the athletic training staff would use so if they were not there or present um, outside of their work hours you could still have access to that room um, and do any treatment that you might need um or and can get done while they're not there our treatment if somebody sprains their thumb or rolls an ankle is going to nfz which is like the public hospital system out here uh just oh. for reference uh, i think i mentioned this to you justin but when i badly sprained my finger off a block this past season, I went to NFZ. I had to wait about four hours to see somebody in the waiting room. And they took about 10 seconds to look at me. They told me to get an x-ray, came back with the x-ray in like 20 minutes. And they just checked the x-ray. Didn't, you know, did, they didn't touch my finger. They didn't try to see range of mobility, nothing. They just told me it's okay. And that was back in December. And boy, my pinkies look different. <laughs> <laughs> so, so... Yeah, don't get me wrong. It's it's not much better with the, the you know it sounds all all you know big and glorious, but most of the time our trainers will go back and just say it needs rest and ice. So, <laughs> man, you know, at least you had shoes. Huh? You had? Yeah, I said at least you got ice to choose from, though. <laughs> I guess, yeah. Um, but yeah, so you know, it wasn't it wasn't much better, but at least you no, know, there wouldn't be anything like a four hour wait. Most of the time, they were in there. Um, well, I think you gave a pretty good overview of you know your culture and how your day to day looked, how your career looked in general as a collegiate athlete. So I'm trying to wrap this segment up with a overarching question of. How would you describe the culture that you developed in um, and how it translated to your professional development into the role that you're in now? Um, Heavy hitting question, right? Take your time. 
I would just say a lot of what um, not only myself, but most college athletes, um, if not all, go through is a little extra layer of um, accountability and um, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Can't help you there, buddy. <laughs> um, accountability and wow, why am I blanking? We've been, but going- yeah, we'll, we'll we'll stick with that. Um, that 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 kind of speaks for itself because you know you are required to juggle not only one thing, which is being a student, which is already hard in itself. Um, you know, especially. You know your 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 professors can decide. You know we're gonna move a test to this day instead of this day, or that paper is now due. You know a week earlier. Um, you you know oh class is canceled. Um, you need to learn this information on your own, or class is canceled. No communication on what you're supposed to be catching up on. So the stress fracture, the stress factors of all of that um, are still very present, and then you add on the um, other stresses of you know having to be an athlete, and you you're you you are um, responsible for being at every practice, being at every match, uh, you know not only on time but early and staying after and then putting in additional work as well outside of it so you know and those practices and games can change as well so you know all of that you know teaches you to be a lot more accountable a lot more respond uh responsible and it really helps you manage your time a whole lot better and i think you see in america at least um a lot of student athletes that graduate, um, you know, find jobs a lot faster because um, people who are hiring uh, recognize that intangible that uh, student athletes have over the majority of um, people who did not live that life. So a lot of times these people find jobs um, a little bit easier than most. Gotcha. I mean, that's a pretty interesting take from what I understand. It sounds like you're saying that athletes on average are a little bit more flexible because of the added stress of one other responsibility that they can tackle for four plus years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just you're 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 able to know how to manage things in the fly. You're able to manage stress a whole lot better because you've been under a ton of it as an athlete. Um in games, in practice. Um, so it's a lot of that stuff is uh, very transferable to your day to day life or your work life. Um, so you see, yeah, I see a lot of um, athletes be super successful post college. Gotcha. Well, Justin, appreciate all your takes that you've given us um, and the breakdown of your collegiate career. I know that we'll be speaking very soon (laughs) about (laughs) a whole plethora of topics, but for now, I want to leave our audience listening to one hot take that an American has on Poland. So, Uh Justin, Uh what city in the U.S. would you compare Warsaw's climate most like to what I think yeah what you think I mean you've gotten a little bit of a cheat sheet because you know me and yeah. I've been for seven months but what what city would you compare it to the most in the U.S. oh my perception of it um would be that it is oh I <laughs> I'm thinking like a Minnesota, if I'm being honest, because I'm just thinking of something that could be super beautiful in the summertime, 
but outside of that, it gets very cold very fast. Did you say North Dakota? I said Minnesota. <laughs> I was like, why are you comparing us to a barren wasteland, bro? <laughs> no, I said Minnesota just for climate. You said climate. Okay. You said climate, right? I did. I did. You're right. I, I, I thought you were saying North Dakota. I got offended. <laughs> no, I was saying like Minnesota because I feel like um, there it's very beautiful in the summers, nice, warm. Um, but just outside of that, it's either summer or winter, you know, very fast, you know, very fast. It turns into, to, you know, a little more of a gloomy, gloomier environment. Um, because of the cloud coverage um, and the cold. So you, um, you know, that's kind of just my perception maybe of, of, uh, of Warsaw, I would say, and maybe some climate there. Not bad, I mean, this, I mean, it's my first winter out here. It's been an easy winter, people are saying, so. Yeah. You know, oh, you could be right. <laughs> All right, guys, well, appreciate you tuning in to episode one. Um, potentially we'll see, we'll catch you on our next call.